Hi, and welcome to Vulnerable. Today I'm going to welcome actor, world-class dancer, beauty mogul, wife, mama, all-around great person, Peta Murgatroyd, to the podcast. Let's talk about her journey with fertility and all things family. Hey, what's up, Peta? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is really nice. Nice to meet you. I know. Nice to meet you. I was going to say you can have your people call my people, but we have the same people, right? So that's exciting. Right. They're good. Yeah. They're good people. This is they're, they're very good people. <laughs> Man. You, okay. So you've been busy since like four years old. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. I haven't stopped working since I've been, well, dancing since I was four, but I've worked all my life. Gosh. It's yeah. When I think back, it's. I've never stopped working. Honestly, like for somebody who I start, so I started even a little bit older than you. So I started at like six and a half and, um, you know, I didn't have training right at six. It seems like you kind of started in on the training and then just, you know, became a pro uh, probably faster than you even were working in the industry. But like, but that all that training was there by the time you started working, it sounds like. And so for me, I was I was like a six and a half year old kid doing like musical theater and kind of it's that on the job sort of like rough neck training. <laughs> so yeah. I yeah. I I do think it's super interesting. So so like, you know, podcast person, like I'm trying to do my due diligence on Wikipedia and whatnot. So I was trying to connect the dots and like because this is the vulnerable podcast, I, I personally really like to kind of weave uh, like a, a linear uh, sort of narrative with you and like your life and um, sort of starting from that beginning. And, and it's funny because that is somewhat challenging sometimes with our guests because you have lived so many lives. Um, but what I did, what I did find interesting was all that training from the get go. So, so you, so you obviously you were born in New Zealand, but then you moved you know, mostly to Australia. Yeah. So I moved to Australia when I was 18 months old, um, mostly due to the fact that my dad was losing jobs over there and just, you know, for the sake of our family and having a better life, they moved us to Australia to sort of start fresh, start clean. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. What did, the, what did your dad do, by the way? What were your parents? What did they do? He was studying to be an architect, um, but then he was always – my mum described it as he was always the last person to be hired um, mm. like in, in the company and then he was the first one to obviously be let go after that. And that kind of kept happening like three or four times and my mum had two young babies so she was like, we need to make this work and we moved to Australia to try to find something, a, a better opportunity for us. Yeah, I would imagine that they've built up Australia quite a lot in terms of like construction and architecture and whatnot over the last yeah. 30, 40 years. They had, I guess, a lot, a lot of more, more freedom and um, jobs available at the time. So my dad became um, a kitchen designer and he also built curtain tracks on the side, you know, curtain tracks where you hang the curtains yeah. on. He did that in our backyard in the tin shed out the back. And um, yeah, so... <laughs> There was a lot going on. It was just like he kind of did anything he could to, to to provide. That's amazing. That's, I mean, honestly, like when we think of male role models and how it starts so early on to to, to see that, um, it's really nice to hear like that that was sort of like your first take on what, because <laughs> it sounds like you have a really great sports system now and sometimes the two mirror each other in some ways, you know? And um, I love I love even seeing my own husband work his butt off. Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible to say, but it is. I'm like, you do it. You do the thing, you know? Like that's, it's, it's, it's also very attractive, you know, as females to see your man stepping up to the plate. Um, and yeah, we've been, through, you know, We've been through hard times, you know, financially with pandemic, you know, entertainers, as you know, there was nothing to do. And, you know, there's there's been some hard times and when we've had to step up and, you know, almost do things that we don't want to do and we've got a, we've got a child and a family to support and, you know, downsize this, downsize that. And then, you know, obviously we're building ourselves back up again. And, you know, there was a lot that went on. Um, wow. But, you know, I look up to my husband too and my dad for, you know, working three jobs sometimes. So it's, you know, it's what you got to do. 
Oh, oh, totally. And so that work ethic too, like probably inspired some of some of that inside of you to to with the dancing. So now, did was it your mom's idea? Were you always dancing and pretending? What what led you to dancing? It must have been a calling for you at a very early age. I guess I, I can't remember if it was a calling for me, but Mum mm-hmm. just put me into like the local ballet classes at the church down sure. the street. Um, and that was just so fun for me. I loved it. I would wear my bathing suit there every day and, um, I would dance in my bathing suit. And then once you become of age to be able to actually start doing proper ballet classes, um, I started doing that and I loved it even more. And they saw a bit of talent, I guess. And that's when I decided to, I think I was 10, I could audition to be in this Russian ballet school. And it's so funny that I look back now and I didn't realize anything. It was just the Russian ballet school for me. But like now right. I'm married to a Ukrainian that speaks Russian and our child understands Russian. And I, it's, it's mind blowing because when I think back, I didn't even think twice about it. We used to speak Russian to our teacher and she was the principal at, um, at um, the Vaganova Ballet. So mm-hmm. it was it, just lots of tie-ins happened. It's like something was trying to tell me back then that I was going to be with a uh, Ukrainian in the future. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really do like that because when your life goes down so many different roads and then you can, like I said, you can tie in that narrative for yourself. It's really gratifying. You're like, you know, it's, it's like they say hindsight is twenty twenty. And yeah. that, that's why you almost have to like trust in the higher power that that's sort of leading you down something as long as you're just, you know, honoring your, your true self and your authenticness and stuff like that. As, as you honor that more and more, I've found too, that it's like, you can ask less questions and trust yeah. more. <laughs> Absolutely. So I actually, some, and by the way, no actual relation to this, but in terms of the emotional experience of being a young dancer. So I, some people may or may not know I had started in, um, you know, I did musical theater in New York. I'm from Connecticut originally and would take the train in and do the, the auditions and whatnot. But I was what my mom called cross training as a, as a dancer at, you know, Broadway, Broadway, Set Broadway dance. Yeah, yeah. And it's the equivalent of millennium in yeah. the West Coast, right? And Broadway Dance Center was where all the Broadway performers would go. And then there was little bitty me dancing and trying to learn to shuffle off to Buffalo. And um, I was never a good dancer, but I my heart was in it fully. And then because of my build, my body structure, and for whatever that's about, I'm tall, um, the School of American Ballet was having their auditions, and I I got in to their their first two a two a one and or a two and a three. So yeah, I was at School of American Ballet, That's and I was I, it was so tough, like physically <laughs> as a young dancer like that when you're twelve yeah. and you're recruited by the best, right? And and it's such a strict level of instruction. Um, what, what, did you find joy in that? I mean, like, what was your relationship to dancing that early on? Was it all positive or was it, was it pretty strict? Extremely strict. And when I say that it was like, they would get out the whips and chains type of thing. Like, yeah. The canes, right. They had little canes. Yeah. I remember they'd point to your feet or this yep. little old lady would do that. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I look back and I, I, I think of myself how I am now as an adult, how I think, how I move, how I go about life. Mm -hmm. And I do have some correlation with how they treated us back then. Not that it was poor, but the level of competition that they had between the girl in front of me at the bar and the girl behind me, Mm. they would us compete against one another. We used to have weekly meetings about food and what we're eating, what we're putting into our bodies, which was good in a sense. I got a great understanding at a very young age of what sugar is, what it does to your body, carbohydrates. And I got the whole spectrum of what I maybe should have learned in my twenties. You know what I mean? Right. Um, And I knew all of that at 10. Like they would say to my mom, only one piece of toast in the morning. Like I can't eat bread all throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Um, And in saying that those were good, but they were also bad too, because that made me, over the years, develop a bad relationship with food, absolutely. Um, I've gone through eating disorders and stuff like that in the past. Um, so in terms of that, it kind of shaped me to be who I am today. Um, also body image issues. You know, I had a good body for ballet, 
But mm-hmm. I was also told, like, parents were brought in for a meeting and I was told that I would have to go straight to be a soloist in a company because we were about to audition uh, in Europe, Germany, London, all of that, um, to wow. get ballet companies. And they said, she's great. She's an amazing dancer, but she's going to have to be so good that she goes straight to soloist because she can't be in the court of ballet because her legs are too short and her body is too long and her neck is nice and long, but it's a little bit too long. We like them to have a little shorter neck. And yeah. It was so specific. My parents were like, what? <laughs> I'm sure. So Peter, when I went to SAB, there was these um, horrendous um, like uh, reports that I had heard, or maybe they were just rumors, but there was girls that were, you know, breaking their feet so that they would grow back to actually be able to hit the floor from their heels. And when they would bend over, it would go directly onto the tippy toe. Their tippy toes would hit the floor and it would be a perfect arch. I was eventually kicked out of SAB um, because of my feet. And I just remembered mm-hmm. that there were people, uh, for my, I guess my feet weren't weren't strong enough, I guess. I wasn't working them out enough. I was never fully there. I was more the razzle-dazzle musical theater geek. <laughs> you were like at the back, just like shaking the hand. <laughs> yeah, 100%, 100%. But I, I'm so grateful because actually I do feel like, you know, learning how to touch my index finger to my thumb and sort of the some of the fundamentals of gracefulness that were sort of injected into my body, I can still say I have an understanding of physically, but I would think that over time, that competitiveness would, would probably be, would be hard, but I'm so proud of you for moving past all that and not letting that ruin to your your relationship to, to dancing, especially like, Yeah. yeah. I realized that along the way though, I didn't just like have this epiphany one day when I was 25, like, oh my God, that's where my eating disorder came from. No, like I didn't have that. But along the way, like, you know, throughout my, I guess, late twenties, early thirties, I was like, ah, you know, I remember my teacher coming to me. She was, her name was Luba Nukonorenko. She was incredible. That happened to me, but she would also tell me when I had a stomach sticking out and when Mm. I come back from vacation and I had a little belly at what, 14. And she would say, Peter, come back to me in two days and I want to see that gone. And it was like those things that I never forgot. And like Mm -hmm. now it's like, oh, I wonder why I didn't love my stomach for so many years. I'm like all of this stuff and, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't hit me till a a later age. Yeah, that makes sense. It it, it takes so long to sort of shed those layers of that, some of that trauma. I mean, because you can take all the good, right? And and then sort of deal with the bad, but it takes some time. <laughs> so as I read as well, because you know, I'm doing doing my doing my my due diligence here. So at 16 you had like a you you hurt your ankle and then you stopped ballet. Mm-hmm. So what was that like? That must have been a big letdown. It was. Um Yeah, so I was really, I was in extreme pain getting up onto my point shoes. I had done point since I was 11 years age, 11 years of age. So I was very accustomed to that. And then all of a sudden I was getting pain, lingering pain, sharp pains and everything. And so my mom took me to see an um, OT and he said pretty much, yeah, she's not going to be able to walk if she continues on like this. So I had a big operation, ankle reconstruction. And then... I continued ballet again. I did six months of rehab and then got back into point shoes and it just wasn't the same for me. I mm. still had a little bit of pain. It wasn't it wasn't what I loved anymore and I think sure. I had just fallen out of love with it because, one, I was told that I wasn't the perfect shape. Two, I was told I'd have to get rid of my fancy fingers. As you know, you can't have <laughs> fancy, fluffy fingers. It all has to be the same. Yeah. You have to look the same as the girl next door. So, um mm. I kind of just went like, what am I doing? I had, that's when I had my first, I guess, life epiphany. I was just like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Like, do I want to do this? And then I had a flyer in our um, letterbox, like one of the days and it said, hey, come do salsa classes at the local rec center. And, you know, it was like a rec center with like a pool that you go to, to take like, you know, swimming yeah. in the pool and like it stunk and it was, you know, one like of the YMCA here in America. <laughs> yeah. Exactly YMCA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I went there and it was like all these oldies, you know, I was 16 going in there, say oldies, but they were probably 40 plus, <laughs> you know, and they're doing, doing their salsa together with their husband and wives. And I went in there, I was like, Hey, I want to do it too. 
Yeah. And I just kept going back and back and I loved it. And then the teacher finally said to me, what are you doing with your life? Why don't you compete? Why don't you do, take this seriously? And I was like, okay, fine, let's do it. And um, the craziest thing that ever happened to me maybe was that I got in about the next three months, I had a tryout, which I didn't even know I was trying out with the Australian champion of Latin dancing, the current championship champion. He had just broken up with his partner <gasps> he was searching for somebody else. Else, He lived in my city and they hooked me up and I nabbed the champion. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> I don't know how to do a rumble walk yet. And he was like, well, I'll teach you. So I was like, okay. It was and like dirty dancing. You were like baby in the corner. It was literally dirty dancing. Yeah. <laughs> so he would train me, no joke, eight hours a day. We would be in the dance studio. I would have books on my head and glasses in my hands and I would have to walk without, you know, like my, my feet were blistered because I, I wasn't used to the Latin shoes either. Mm-hmm. Like it was different from ballet. I had to keep my, turn everything in. Right. That's the- so hard from the duck walk, yeah. as we call it, yeah. to, to, to inverting. And, and that's a lot of the reason why it's so hard to master like hip hop for somebody who's had like, you know, like to get low, to have your area of gravity just be centered low instead of up high on your toes. So hard. Hip hop is not my forte. Do never watch me do a hip hop routine. This is not me. I'm terrible. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Seconded. Seconded. So, so now you were training with him. That's so amazing. So, did he have more of a mentorship kind of relationship to you, or yeah. how did? That's great. Yeah, it was definitely more mentor. He was like my teacher. We obviously had a higher teacher coach as well eventually, but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't even know what I was doing for the first six months. I honestly didn't. And then we threw ourselves into a competition. We did some shows for people to get me experienced with, you know, being in front of the people and um, wearing costumes like that. I was used to a leotard and tights and now it's no tights. It's bare legs and sexy outfits, you know. So <laughs> it was, but I loved it, you know. I think that was way more up my alley, um, mm-hmm. I guess, than ballet. Your fingers could be fluffy, Peter. <laughs> I know. I could be fluffy. I could have some hips, you know. Yes, a little. Yeah. You could be a voluptuous girl if you wanted to be. Right. Right. And you could still, and you could still be the best, even with all your body curves. (laughs) That's really exciting. So now you, you ended up going into sort of the professional side of this after competition and, and like, I think you just kind of blew it out of the water. I mean, you were on tour for for a long period of time. You were such a hard worker. Yeah, um, I was on tour for six years um, with Burn the Floor. Um, again, I just went in there as a solo person because we eventually broke up that first partner of mine. Right. Um, I actually don't know why we broke up. I can't remember. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go and burn the floor. Like this is, I love stage because from ballet, I was so used to being on the stage and not the competition floor. And I wanted to go back to my roots with that, but I could do boring dancing on a stage. Right. I was so happy when they called me and said, hey, can you come and dance with us? And that was it. That was the beginning of my new life as a boring dancer going around the world by myself with, with this company. Wow. And then finally landed on Broadway in 2009. That's amazing. So you left Australia and just started traveling the world. You were like 18 or 19? Yeah, I was 18. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That yeah. must have been a lot of fun, I hope. And I'm sure there was drama along the way. But when oh, yeah. you tour with people for six years, like, I mean, people are in, people are out, yeah. uh, you know. Drama. Lots, lots of drama and stuff like that. But yeah. and, and, and it is, it almost feels like you're on your own reality show, which, which I find kind of interesting. Um, I actually toured as well. When I was a kid, I was about six and a half and I went um, on these Broadway musical tours. And yeah. being a kid in those experiences is also really interesting because you know, all the adults are like, who's hooking up with who and like somebody's cheating on their spouse. It's just like all the tea that you never wanted. And you do kind of though, at the end of the day, you become a family because when you are on stage, getting that, that one, that, that connection with the audience is just like you said, it's like, there's nothing compared to it. No. So is is that what you love most about dancing then, do you think? 
It is. It is. I love touring. I think that's my favorite thing to do. Um, I love live television, but it is not the same as being on a live stage with seeing the audience's faces in front of you and then feeling every move that you make. And, and I, there's nothing like it. It's like tantalizing. I can't, it's like, it's a drug. <laughs> drug. Yeah. Yes. And that's why I love touring, like with my spouse, Max and Val and hopefully Jenna will get to do the tour that we wanted to do with all four of us. Cause it got canceled twice with the pandemic. Um, but that's why we do it because we just love it. That's awesome. I mean, there's nothing better than working with the people you love. And even sometimes when you're married or related to them, which is it's it, it that when it works well, it works so well. Totally. Um, so did you actually, didn't you, did you meet your husband on burn the floor, burn the floor? I did, but we were with different people. So right. It was not even like a thought in my mind, like mm-hmm. not even a snippet, not even nothing. Cause I'm, right. I'm a very loyal person. So I'm like, no, I have a boyfriend and yeah. he's engaged to Karina. So yeah. it, it was a very non-topic, but then I saw him when I would do my blindfold number, he would watch me in the wings. And I remember thinking that is odd that this guy just keeps standing there and he is standing there the whole number always. He was always there. And I'm like, why is he standing there watching me all the time? And I, I was just like, that is odd. And then now that I think about it, he was just like, yeah. Did he tell you, did he ever, did he ever like dish that he was actually like secretly like in love with you or did he not even realize it? He did tell me. He didn't uh, know if that was love, but he was like, he said the word like infatuated. Like he he saw something that he just loved about me, but he wasn't like in love with me then. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It, it must be interesting for two dancers to fall in love because it's not necessarily, I'm sure that obviously physical attraction is a part of all of it, but, but it must be different than like, I, this is me just throwing it out there. Cause I mean, like I know the body image is something that, people struggle with, but a dancer to a dancer must have so much more respect for another person's body. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think there's definitely pros and cons though, of being with somebody that has the same, um, you know, work as you, Mm -hmm. Um, meaning, you know, I, I, when we are dancing together and stuff like that, or we fight like cat and dog, you know, through choreography <laughs> and stuff like that. But it's also amazing because we can share those experiences together as well and, and dance together and feel that and have those moments on stage. Um, yeah. 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 Not many people can say that they, that they can have that together. So, and yeah. now, I mean, you know, I, I'm really excited for you as well. You have a family that y'all are building and, Uh, recently, you know, you've been talking a lot about your journey with, um, fertility and the IVF shots, which I just want to commend you for, because there's really just so many women out there that, that, that have uh, in, in generations past suffered in silence and, you know, you, you bringing awareness to it makes them feel like they are not alone. And so I'm curious, have you had a lot of people reach out to you and thank you as well, or any DMS that it has been overwhelming. And I got to say, like, it's, beyond a pregnancy announcement or anything. It was just like a flood of support, a flood of like, oh my God, thank you. I'm going through that too. And I feel awful about myself. You know, I've gone through these dark days and like all of it. And it's been overwhelming for me to read too, but also so positive and uplifting. And um, them sharing my story, their stories with me makes me feel better too. It's like an all round um, support, but circular support. Yeah. Of just yeah. like, oh my God, I'm so glad I did this. Cause I didn't want to say, I don't know if you read the, article, yeah, I did. mm-hmm. but I didn't want to say a word. I was so terrified, so embarrassed. So like, mm. oh my God, this happened to me. How? Like mm. it was just mortifying moments for me. And I was beyond, I was never going to speak about it. I was going to take it to the grave and just get pregnant and never say anything to anybody. So I'm, uh, in hindsight, it's so much better now that I said it. I feel good. I, I know that I'm helping people and, you know, I, it's a weight lifted off my shoulders and it's ultimately helped my mental health as well. Yeah, I, I am curious. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, sort of like the concept of the body, right? Like the concept of being a dancer and growing up with the body image 
the the sort of focus on your body. And there was a thing that you had said, which was like, people keep asking me, like, why won't you do this? When will you do this? Like, almost like they own your body. But at the end of the day, what I found so great about you, you took back the power for your own body by telling and sharing this. And yes, it was hurtful, maybe on some level, probably to share that there's, there's a risk there, right? Because if you haven't talked about that, it, it's scary. Like there's things in my life that I probably won't share with people because it's just too scary. And we all are allowed that even if we're public people and people think they know us for years on end, right? But, but there's just some things that we deserve to have for ourselves. But, you know, I do think in this instance, it must have been pretty empowering as well after so many years of, of having people remark on your body for you to like take that back. Yeah, it, it was empowering to take that back. I think I just got to a point where I was like, I'm so sick of reading this shit. Like I need to either confess and say why and tell people. But then on the other hand, I was like, well, it's none of nobody's business either. Right. Like why am I sharing such a personal thing that's happening to me? Am I just doing it to please them? And ultimately at the end of the day, it wasn't just to please them. It was to um, release myself from this prison of guilt and this prison of like not being able to tell people why, you know, the real reason why, not, oh, because we're just waiting, you know, and right. keep lying to everybody and keep keeping the secret under wraps. But um, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was hurtful, I guess, and just tiring in the end. I was just tired of reading it. Um, you know, some comments were, you know, how could you not, how could you not give shy a sibling, you know, and Again, if they knew what I was going through and what I had been going through and how long I'd been trying, it would have just changed everything. And so I was just like, what the hell? I'm going to release myself from this and, and talk. And your, and your husband supported you, I'm assuming. Where was it? Where was it? I mean, also, we should speak about maybe like on the side of like, you know, family and the pressures of building a family for performers and, um, especially women performers, women dancers. Um, I mean, Jesus, like people don't realize how much pressure you're under. I, I feel like I can relate even though I'm not a dancer, but man, um, your husband was in the Ukraine and, um, he was working as a judge for dancing with the stars in Ukraine, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and so not too long ago, did he just come home or like, when was that exactly that he just came home from Ukraine? I mean, that must've been a while ago. Um, well, he, he'd had multiple trips there. Um, the last one being when the war broke out and he got stuck there for that nine days or whatever it was. Um, yeah. but yeah, during, during one of the times I, I had a miscarriage while he was away or all of the times. He was, oh my God. Seriously. Oh, yeah, he was away for all three and yeah, it was brutal, absolutely brutal to make those phone calls each time. You know, it was just like, I can't believe this is happening to me again. And, you know, I do believe that I would have kept the third. I, I, I truly, I had this crazy experience. So I'll quickly just say this. So when I, I went to go see him in the Ukraine when he was judging Dancing with the Stars, um, I was there for the total of three days because I was trying to catch my ovulation window. I was just like, all right. I'm You're like, do let's do this, baby. <laughs> I was like, I'm flying to the other side of the world to do this, so we better be doing this right. So um, one of the days I went um, with him along with a um, one of our friends in Ukraine to one of the holiest temples. Um, gosh, I, the name is escaping me right now, but it is the most glorious church-like underground tunnels where saints live and it is it is a mind-blowing experience and we spent like half a day there praying going around with the priests and everything and they knew why we were there um and I came outside afterwards I felt beautiful I felt enlightened and then we had this moment where we were on a major road and this elderly lady came up to us and to me, she looked like a regular elderly lady, but Max said, no, she's homeless, but she didn't look homeless. She looked hmm. kind of put together and she came up and she asked us for money. And Max said, I don't have any. And so she said, no, please, please, please give me some money. So we found some money at the bottom of the bag. And as Max was giving her the money, she starts pointing to my belly and she's like, you, 
you were going to get pregnant. Don't you worry. And she said it in Russian and she said it to, to me and Max was like, oh, God, oh, God, like this is super weird. She, this is a, just a random person on the side of the street. But it, she was near the temple and the church, so I don't know what was going on, but I walked away and Max was like, keep walking, because he's kind of like this big juju guy, like <laughs> almost like she was like cursing us or something. Okay. You're like, no, that's a good thing, honey. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. Anyway, so I got pregnant the next day and wow. um, I flew home pregnant, didn't know it, and then caught COVID and then had a miscarriage. And I believe it was because I had caught COVID and my body couldn't fight both of them. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was this, so this was the, was this the most recent one then or? Yes, that was the most okay. recent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, and just to educate some people. So the way that the miscarriages work is that once they're, once it's all passed and through, you go through a couple cycles, right? Before you start IVF treatments. Is that sort of what is suggested? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, miscarriage is is, is really shitty. Um, I, I yeah, I, I actually I have miscarried before, and um, it's a uh, it's a really horrible thing. And I I I love you to death, like woman to woman. Um, you went through that too. Okay. Yeah, it's shitty. Um, it's um. It's, it's, and I, 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 I do pray for you. I mean, like, I, I really want, I want this to be a thing of the past for you. I mean, and then the other thing is you have your son, right? <laughs> how has he been, how has he been doing? I mean, can he read any of the stuff that's out there? Or is that just not of a concern in terms of y'all being sort of a family unit at this point? Yeah, he knows absolutely nothing. Um, yeah. Apart from the fact that, you know, a lot was going on in the last year and a half, you know, yeah. when we're stuck in a war zone, like there was a lot going on that this, the amount of stress that our family was under at one point was debilitating. I was on the couch. It was, it was an extremely bad situation. Um, and at times I had to take myself away because I really needed to cry. I really needed to have that outlet and not let him see me every single day with burnt ring, red rings around my eyes that I couldn't get away. So he, he felt that there was something going on. He knew because, you know, he also saw me get carted out on a gurney to hospital with COVID. So it it was a real traumatizing six months. I think it was like a six month period. Um, and, um, you know, at one stage he was, he keeps asking me, when is the baby going to be back? When is the baby going to be back? And I say, you know, soon baby, you know, he keeps asking me and, you know, at one point he was right. You know how babies are kind of in tune with other babies. Yeah. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. I didn't even know I was pregnant. And he pointed to my tummy and he said, mommy, you got a baby in there. And I was mm -hmm. like, Oh, Oh, you sweetheart. Oh, you know, like I was just like, Oh, let's make some toast, you know, move. Yeah. Off. And but one piece of toast, Peter, one piece yeah. of toast. <laughs> <laughs> one piece. We don't want to be fatties. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Jokes. We got jokes here on Vulnerable. Listen, Peta has a heart out because she is doing a million things. And I do want to mention, um, as our thoughts and prayers are going to her, we can catch her on her socials and, and we're, we're watching your journey, right? With IVF, which is, it's going to help so many people. And it, so is it just on your Instagram? Like, where can we find you with all of this? Yeah, pretty much. I'm, I'm uploading things to Instagram mainly and they kind of transfer over to Facebook. So yeah. Amazing. I want everyone to go and support her and give her all the love that we could possibly give her. And then we also have a beauty line that we want to talk about too, that, that I'm yeah. sure has been in the midst of all the craziness. You've also become a beauty mogul. <laughs> yes. that, that's what I'm, yeah, that, that has honestly been my main focus throughout this whole craziness and, you know, obviously trying to get pregnant as well, but this has been my savior as well as my son, um, just to be able to get away, go to the office and work on new products and, you know, launch the new ones that we had come out. We now have six SKUs. Um, so, yeah, we started with one product. Um, we launched February 2021 um, and now we have six products uh, and it's going really, really well. We went to Miami and we got an award for Best Self Tanner there. So, Which is huge. 
<laughs> if you're getting like in Miami, the best self tanner, that's like the huge thing. I know. And it's just like a dream come true. And since then it's just kind of taken off. More people know about it now where we're getting into more stores and um, it's growing beautifully. So it's, it's my baby. Honestly. That's your, that's, that's your labor of love, so to speak. So, so where can we purchase that? Is it on Amazon? Where can we buy it? Um, you can get it online at peterjanebeauty.com. Um, there are select stores that are on our Instagram too, and you can buy it off Instagram, obviously, and Shopify. Um, but yeah, we have a locations that stock our product, like spas and wellness centers, and it's all oh, fun. on our Instagram page. Oh, I'm excited. I want to try the self-tanner. Um, sure. well, Peter, thank you very much for your time. And I'm looking forward to obviously following along on your journey. But then, especially if you go back on tour, I hope you come through Austin. <laughs> I live in Austin, Texas. Oh, yeah, so. we love Austin, Texas. Yeah. Yeah, it's hot. You might want to wait a little while. But... <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Mm-hmm.